For more on uh, today's Fed decision, let's bring in Jim O'Neill, former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. He's also a former minister uh, in the U.K. Treasury. Uh, you got to hear uh, everything Rick, Rick and, and Steve both said, Jim. Uh, you agree with most of that? Well, first of all, Joe, I haven't seen you for a while, but you're looking pretty good on your uh, uh, preferences for food, I have to say, there. Uh, uh, well done, You're mate. very nice. You're very nice. Kind of, uh, jealous, kind of jealous of you. Anyhow. I work um, out. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Go, <laughs> yeah, go well, listen, uh, uh, listening to Rick especially, I, I'm kind of laughing to myself, thinking uh, he summed it up beautifully for me. There, there is... So, and I've just put something out on this a few days ago. There has been so many twists and turns that have always, effectively, without fail, surprised the let's call it the short-term consensus about the economy, inflation, and the Fed the past eighteen months. Um, the Fed's trying to do the right thing. It, it sides towards, which I think is with some justification, the improving inflation outlook. But they can't have a lot of confidence because there's been all these twists and turns. What I, what I would add more, more controversially going around my head that I also touched on in this piece, I find myself thinking that maybe the real story, and here I, I differ a bit with the tone of Rick uh, and um, the whole discussion, is that may, maybe the flip side of what was conventional thinking from the Bernankes and the Yellens and even Greenspan the past 25 years is that this sort of, what we what happened to this notion of sort of low real rates because of savings gluts and blah, 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 blah. You know, I find myself thinking that what might be really emerging if we are, for, for various complex reasons, emerging from this very complex world since 08, that maybe we end up with rates being higher for longer uh, so that real rates stay positive as to what used to be the normal belief of people trained like me back in the 70s, 80s and 90s before we got into all this kind of weird savings club stuff. Because it doesn't look to me that, even though that was a very clever explanation as to what was going on, it's not clear to me that that really stood the test of time and hasn't done the past two years, that's for sure. So I, in that sense, I think we'll get the optimistic tone about inflation, but I, I think the idea that the Fed might carry on through time putting rates up more is something that's very much in my head if the economy stays strong and unemployment stays low. I remember how I used to think about interest rates too, Jim, and it, it like... I used to say, well, they can't go below zero, and I didn't know that that could happen, and, and things like that actually had. So not, nothing surprises me anymore. But it, bottom line, Jim, for, for business, for business and the cost of money, is this restrictive right now for a successful business <laughs> if, if it has to borrow at 5 percent? It, it just doesn't seem like, seems like it's something that, that, that we can handle. And that for that reason, maybe we don't see cuts and the 10 year might be totally wrong. I mean, I think that's the message that the markets are saying. Uh, and it's certainly consistent with long term history. Um, you know, in the earliest days of my time at, at Goldman, uh, when I was the uh, co head of research, I, I goaded uh, Bill Dudley and his colleagues. And Bill obviously went off to run the New York Fed many years later to create these financial conditions indicators and financial conditions uh, are pretty accommodative. And even though rates have risen sharply the past 18 months, uh, if they were really, really punitive, I would have thought financial conditions would have struggled to have done what they've done. Um, and so I, I, if that's partly why I have this sort of growing idea in my head that maybe we're really returning to uh, some kind of vague normality before some of uh, all these weird things that were going on in the, in the build-up to the crisis and the crisis itself. Uh, and, and a, you know, again, a complete uncertainty about Russia and energy prices elsewhere in the world. But may well be that if we slowly emerge from COVID uh, around the world too, and for Europe more than the US, the energy issues to do with Russia... You know, maybe the world might have a better position 
to, to cope with high rates than there's been so much conventional thinking for the past few years. Who knows? I mean, who knows, frankly, but I wouldn't dismiss that in my own mind. Well, think if money's free, what happens? And then, you know, think if, right. suddenly, think if suddenly it's back to where if you're going to, you know, risk capital, the, the, you know, there's carrying costs in it. I mean, if it's free, all this stuff happens. You wonder why we have problems when there's nothing, there's no governor on, on doing crazy stuff. So, I mean, oh, I mean I, you yeah. know, I'm with you there on that, Joe. I was going to touch on this part earlier, but I wanted to make the bigger point. But, you know, I will never forget uh, the early 90s when what was really until this recent period only the, the particularly persistent short period of rapidly rising bond yields and rising rates. And I, I was hanging out with a group where we thought it was going to happen and we thought we were geniuses, but we all still got wasted because we weren't as smart as we thought we were. And the truth of the matter is that rising rates will always find out people that have got weak businesses, as we're seeing again. Uh, but that does not mean to say that the broader economy itself goes into the slammer, right. as we're sort of, right. sort of seeing.